Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 10. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. There appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. So far, our text. Please be seated. Emmy, you can push the... Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Yes, it's pathetic, nauseating pictures of dogs with roses in their mouths and cloud hearts. That's coming up. Are you ready? It happens every year, and I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to focus on love once a year. I mean, we focus on God's love every Sunday. But the hallmark holiday that is Valentine's Day is a little, eh, kind of over the top. But I... It, it has a place, I suppose. And we will start um, the 40-day journey to the cross where we see God's love in action. It may not look like it from a first glance. I kicked around doing Lent for kids one year, but I don't know that it would have the same effect as Easter for kids. And yet, if you've never done Lent before, but you've always done Easter, man, you're missing out. My kids don't understand why I love Lenten song. Why the passion accounts are so powerful. It's because that's true love. That's what that is from our God. Well, today we, we are just right there. We're right on the edge. But it's Transfiguration Sunday, and I said already, we're going to go forward under the theme, Transfigure Your Love. Emmy, you can push the next picture for me. We're going up on that mountain, and we're going to see Jesus in all of his glory display his love for us. We're going to see the picture of God's love. We're going to see the declaration of God's love. Then we're going to see God's love in motion. So what exactly does that look like? Let's jump into our text, verses 2 and 3. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. There is an inner circle that went off with Jesus more than once. Peter, James, and John, they're the ones that go off in the Garden of Gethsemane. And other times, he takes these three men with them. The twelve disciples, you'd say that's pretty close to be part of that circle. I mean, there were hundreds of disciples that Jesus had, of course. And you hear them spoken about in different chunks in the gospel. But these 12 followed Jesus around. And then there were times when Jesus said, okay, just you three. Come with me. This is one of those instances where he takes just the three and you see him transfigured and it was awesome. But why don't we get Peter's take on it? This is 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory saying, This is My Son whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. The majestic glory. It, how, would, how do you describe heaven is finally what happens. Your mind buckles. What does it look like? You just say, I, I, I don't know. It's amazing. 
the Greek word metamorphothē. It's the word we use for change. Metamorphosis. Think caterpillars to butterflies. Just a complete difference. It didn't look like Jesus anymore. It looked like God. And that's the picture that you'll see one day finally in heaven. And you have to kind of dwell on that just for a second because what's coming up in Lent is so bad. Transfiguration Sunday is a very important historical time because when you look at him in the Passions accounts, the temptation is to look away. Who wants to see that? That's why it's important to remember as you enter into these 40 days in the wilderness, who your God is and how awesome he is, and to not forget this burning image in your head of Almighty God. That's the picture of God's love. All right, Emmy. Let's keep going. All right. Let's go on to the declaration of God's love. What exactly does that look like? Um, first of all, we're not going to go to our text. We're going to go back to the baptism. You see, have you ever gotten a love letter from a loved one? And we don't, who writes letters? I mean, we text, right? For worse, probably. Letter writing is kind of a lost art to see someone's own handwriting. Um, I, how many, I don't know if you even get letters. I know that um, the, the, the grandparents send my kids letters or cards. And that's important because it was handwritten. Somebody took the time to do that. Uh, that can be still powerful when I do outreach to people. If I take time to write a letter or write a note on somebody's door and then leave it, that's, that means that that's important. Whereas an email, even though you can craft this wonderful email, he just copied and pasted that. You know, it doesn't sound very personal. Well, years ago, you would save all the letters. When, when my dad was in the Navy, my mom uh, would write him every day. And I said, yeah, but he wouldn't get the letters. I mean, he's across the ocean. And I don't know what the turnaround was, a month? And she said, it doesn't matter. You carry in a conversation a month apart <laughs> because she would get the letters from my dad. And sometimes they'd come in a clump. But that's what you did. You wrote them every day. That's how you carry on a relationship long distance. We, we, we don't even get it because there's no such thing as long distance. Well, those letters, if you could pile them up, are powerful. And you hear people say, well, we'll always have this event in life of Paris, or I don't know, what some grand place that you went, summer camp, if that was your first love, the first time you saw them. Well, I think that this is kind of what the disciples were going through, only you go back not to some time, you go back to your baptism. You have to go back to your baptism when you hear Jesus say, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Because it was at the baptism where you first heard that declaration of God's love for his son. And in baptism, that declaration is for you. Do you understand that these are bookmarks of the Epiphany season as well? It's not by accident the church did this. So that you remember that you're loved by God at the beginning of the season and at the end. And that's how God reveals himself to you. Epiphany means reveal. It's the grand picture of our church here. Because with Jesus, you were buried into baptism so you might live and rise. It means the next picture, baptism, I believe. Yeah, that's that river that you go through. I don't know if that's actually a picture of the River Jordan. doesn't matter. For our purposes, it is. And those are the waters where all of you were baptized. That's where I want you to be. So now when you hear this verse 7, you are ready then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Three years later, God still loves Jesus because he's perfect. And God still loves you because Jesus is perfect. <laughs> That's where it goes. It doesn't matter how, what your performance is. We're going to get to love exactly and our reaction to it in a bit, but just focus just for a second on God's never-changing love for you and the powerful sacrament that is baptism that can never change. That's the promise attached to that washing. 
That's yours. And that's awesome. Well, we keep going. You've, heard, you've seen the picture. You've heard the declaration. So let's see that love in motion. Emmy, what's next? Yes. The Valentine candy gram. Oh, my word. Yes. Uh, as PTO president once upon a time, I think we delegated that to some school group. But <coughs> the idea is that parents normally, and as you get older, you get into middle school, you get some brave children who will fill out one of these cards and do it for the object of their affection or into high school. Well, you give these out for like a buck or two, whatever. We'll give somebody a candy bar with your name on it with a little note, okay? And this is a big production. This is how we raise money for the school. Well, you get to pay money to do that. And this is kind of love in action. That's how some people can show that love. And normally, the mom sends it to the third grade son or dad to the daughter or whatever. It's fine. It's, it's good. Well, I, <laughs> this is where it gets kind of ridiculous. Um, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. Wait a second. You mean we can't tell anybody about this? And what do you, what do you mean rising from the dead? That would imply that you'd be dead, right? They're just not connecting the dots at all. They're just like, let's, let's go back up the mountain. This is awesome. Why are we leaving this? This is the, the Super Bowl of events with, with Jesus. I mean, Halftime show, this is incredible. Yeah, and you're telling me I can't tell anybody about this? It's just the exact opposite, isn't it? I just heard God the Father thunder his love, and now the action you want me to do is keep my mouth shut? Well, the reason for this is that people had a bad idea about Jesus. They thought that he was this political ruler who would kick out the Romans, put a chicken in every pot, that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. But that's not that exciting. That doesn't wipe away credit card debt. That doesn't get rid of the Roman thugs. And so they weren't interested in hearing that. And if you told people, yeah, by the way, that guy is brighter than the sun if you get him by yourself. That, that just, that's the wrong message. They wouldn't get it. That's why they couldn't say anything. And still today, I wonder when people talk about Christianity, do they understand the spiritual wealth that my God wants to bring, but do they just dismiss that because he can't handle the, the car repair? He can't necessarily fix my marriage with the snap of his finger. I don't know. And so when we talk about God's love in action, I wonder what people see. I mean, let's go one more. Keep going. Yes. Ah, the proposal. This is the best that Peter, James, and John can offer. <clears throat> and there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said, Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. This is the part of the text that gets really confusing in a hurry. And I wonder, have you ever tried to express your love but the words just didn't come out that well? Well, I have. Yeah, sometimes I'm not always that smooth. And uh, I, I, I think I do have pretty good intentions, but I don't always communicate those very well. Um, you can ask me about how I proposed to my wife and how she couldn't help but say yes. It was so romantic. <laughs> But, yeah, Peter's expressing his, his joy here. I don't know if you want to, it's not a direct correlation, but he's kind of babbling. Let me put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Th this chunk of scripture honestly raises more questions than what it answers. And so some people say, number one, how did he know it's Moses and Elijah? They've been dead for hundreds of years. And this gets back to heaven. Do you, Paul says, you will know even as you're fully known. When you walk through the streets of heaven, like I told the kids, oh yeah, that's Joshua. That's Caleb, those two spies that we're learning about right now. I remember them. 
that's my great, great, great grandpa. He kind of looks like me. You know, it, it, will, will that be what it's like? Will you just notice? Will you go up to high five, Jesus? When we went through, through the shack, there was a whole chapter on that grand reunion. That was just awesome. Just one picture that that author had. And it's just incredible to think what it might be like. Well, some people say, why Moses and why Elijah? Those two bookends, Moses began, you heard that in the introduction to the second lesson, Moses was the uh, beginning of God's people, and Elijah saw it through its most difficult time, when there was just spiritual darkness, and Elijah said, there's nobody left, and God said, yep, there is. I preserve for myself some people. And what were they talking about? Well, I suppose his suffering as he was about to enter his time when he was about to die for the sins of the world. But again, we don't really know. For whatever it was, Jesus talked to them, and then they went down the mountain. And so, what does love in action look like? This is where we kind of need to talk about what love is in our world. If I say I love pizza, what does that mean? Well, it means I love how it tastes. I love how I'm full, like I feel like I want to explode afterwards. I just love it. It's everything about it. I love what it does for me. Okay? Is that really how shallow love is in our society? That I love what something or someone does for me? Is that really as deep as it goes? Maybe. Our God's love is so different, isn't it? I love things that are beautiful. I love things that are fun. I love things that are meaningful. Now let's change gears. Well, well, how does that work with God and me? God loves me because I am fun, wonderful. God loves me because I'm so faithful, because I obey His command. No. That's not why God loves me. And let's go one more. What about this suffering servant Jesus? If you go to the first few verses of Isaiah 53, you hear the words of our Savior. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to Him. Nothing in His appearance that we should desire Him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, He was despised, and we esteemed Him not. There is nothing lovely about that suffering servant for whom we would die. And so, the theme's not going to change too much. It's going to get a little bit more intense on Ash Wednesday in three days. But I invite you all to come back or at least watch online at 7 o'clock as you see that love unleashed. As that fire burns and we're left just as ashes. What does love look like when it takes action? And the answer is it looks like Jesus. Even though you don't want to look at Him. In fact, you want to look away. That's what love in action is. And if I started out this little chunk of the sermon by pizza, I mean, how do you end it? I didn't know exactly how to bridge that except going to our God. If it's so selfish, it becomes selfless. And the object lesson that our God gives is a marriage. It's husband and wife, isn't it? Husbands, love your wives. He doesn't just end there. He makes the grand example of Jesus and the church. The bride and, or the groom, excuse me, is Jesus, and the, the bride is the church. It's us. That's that incredible love. I mean, you talk about crushing responsibility. Am I equipped to love my wife so selflessly that I would give up everything for her? I don't know. Leadership's terrifying. Knowing that the buck stops with me and that my family's future depends on my 
ministration of my family? I, am I, can I do that? But my God lifts me up, and he forgives me, and he empowers me to love. It's impossible for a husband to say, I don't love you anymore. <laughs> Those words, a husband can't say that. It, it's not possible. Because Jesus cannot say to the sinner, I don't love you anymore. It's not possible. And so to be an object of that love is transforming. That's what happens to the bride of Christ who is ugly. And yet because of his love, you're beautiful. At least not on the, maybe not on the outside, but at least on the inside. You are gorgeous to your God because you're perfect and holy. That's what happens when God proposes to the Christian. Be mine. <clears throat> and when you are, you're perfect in him. Dear friends, transfigure your love. You've seen the picture of love. You've heard the declaration of love from the Heavenly Father. And you're going to see God's love in action as we go into the season of Lent. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We continue with the creating me, how do we worship?